welcome everybody. I have with me Bo Cab Malone, who many of you may know from YouTube. Um, he's a street apologist, a Christian apologist, and he did uh, Islamicize Me. And he does many videos with uh, debunking Hebrew Israelism, um, Islamic polemicism, Christian apologetics, and uh, yeah, here he is. So, hi, how are you? I'm glad to be here. How are you doing, Kay? I'm very well, thank you. It's quite a bit later where I am than it is for you, so mm. I'm going to jump in. I just, I guess I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about how did you get into uh, Christianity, firstly, and apologetics, secondly? Well, I was blessed to have great parents, and they showed me an example of the Christian faith from a very young, young age, and um, I had some understanding of the basics of the gospel at a young age, and then uh, when I was late high school is when, uh, you know, brass tacks, rubber hits the road. And I wanted to uh, make sure this was what I was going to do, be a, be a Christian for real. And so I embarked upon a sort of personal apologetics journey. Uh, I don't know if I quite realized exactly that's what it was at the time uh, to say, is this true? And uh, that's, that's not how I first had my interest in apologetics, but that certainly was my first deep dive into apologetics. And it really never left because then eventually I realized some of the stuff I encountered, other people needed to know, and it could be helpful for them as well. Yeah. What I found in my uh, life was that God put certain people in my life. And at the time, specifically one person who was Muslim, a um, very good friend, but I would wonder over and over, like, why am I arguing these cases? I wasn't a very strong Christian. And if I'd have been speaking with a Christian, I may well have argued an Islamic point. Like, I just liked arguing, really. Um, and all of those things, when I look back, when I got to Speaker's Corner, I was like, oh, that's why I've been arguing with a Muslim for five years. Oh, right, that was the reason I read the Quran. Because somehow it would be, like Romans 8, 28, it would be used um, for the good. Um, so that's that. And did you find that, so where you grew up, uh, like, were you in a minority as a Christian at school or was it just kind of atheism and agnosticism or? Like, um, it just, there weren't any strong Christians around that I really remember of when I was in uh, the public schools, but I spent a few years at Christian or private school. So I had a, a mixture. And so it depended on what context I was at but it was rare in the public schools to find anyone in any kind of way public. Um, you know, it wasn't um, necessarily massive hostility, but there was definitely mockery, ridicule, and um, lack of interest. And some of the first kind of religious debates I saw actually uh, in high school, the things I was mainly exposed to was actually the 5% style of Islam, which is not really true or proper Orthodox Islam, but that's really what I encountered as far as people saying, well, actually, no, look at this. Here's the way to interpret this. That kind of thing was a lot of 5% stuff. So that is some of the first stuff I really encountered, a 5 center theology and, and general Afrocentric views of history. Yeah, I think there seems to be, at the moment, I, I know essentially you're talking about in the past, but at the moment, there seems to be a real dissonance among like between the versions for one the versions of islam that there are but for two the the mainstream media's um portrayal whether it's their understanding of islam is like a separate issue but their portrayal of islam and the actual quran and what's then taught in the masjids and like in the mosque so you can have people defending um a theology or a religion and it simply doesn't say that like they're um it's not even cherry picking with the abrogation, but they fail to see the bigger picture, which is fair enough. I did the same thing. I just thought, oh, it's, there's only one God from the Bible. So I just assumed that anybody who was called God must be a manifestation of the one God and misinterpreted, but I don't believe that anymore. So um, that's quite a good segue, actually, because I've been um, obsessed a little bit by Christian persecution lately. So I was praying for some, I don't know, way to help more people or to make people aware of the true situation, um, bearing in mind the false uh, premises and like betrayal of Islam. Um, 
So with regards to Christian persecution, I'd like, I think everybody on my channel hopefully is aware that I'm aware and hopefully they're becoming more educated, but it really is like the government of my country at least has admitted that it's genocidal, that there are something like, let me tell you now, there are 245 million people who are in high or extreme levels of persecution for their Christian faith, and that's globally. That's just an insane number. Um, there are 50 million Christians facing higher levels of persecution in another 23 countries on top of the 50 top countries for persecution. And high to extreme levels includes things such as rapes, murders, false imprisonments, uh, lo loss of earnings, loss of income, torture, uh, being held hostage, being beheaded, dismembered, set on fire. I might be missing some things out. So do you know much about it? Have you looked into it in the past? Um, like I haven't had the chance to watch all of your massive back catalogue. I mean, it's possible you've spoken about it before, but what are your opinions on it? And do you think the American government are doing enough as a Christian nation? Do you have? Well, yeah, I've got some uh, maybe somewhat older stats than what you have, because a lot of um, what I've looked at recently uh, about this is actually from a really good book I recommend, Crucified Again by uh, Raymond Ibrahim. And in that book, he says that in January of 2012, so basically it's got worse, Reuters is estimated 100 million Christians are persecuted, but then the Secret Service of Britain, M16, they put the number, and this is back then, twice as high, 200 million. And then uh, you have a human rights rep for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. They estimated uh, then that a Christian is killed for their faith, quote, every five minutes. And so, um, you know, do I think the United States is, is doing enough? Well, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, tricky issues here because you have to wonder sort of on a strictly political level, uh, a country like the United States, where are they supposed to be involved in the world and where are they not supposed mm -hmm. to be involved? And I think uh, United States foreign policy maybe has made a lot of mistakes in those areas throughout our history. So it's tricky, but I, I do know regardless of what the United States does, it should not be doing this. And it has done this in the past, which is aiding and abetting radical Islamist factions within different countries by doing things like giving them weapons and weapons training. And a lot of times the United States has done this uh, simply because they saw um, sort of a lesser of two evils, say the immediate threat is deemed to be Russia or the Soviet Union, which I think is legitimate enough to understand as a threat, especially say we're talking about during Russia's invasion of Afghanistan. Well, mm -hmm. what is the United States end up doing? Uh, giving the, the, the quickest sort of ready make rebel faction there weapons and weapons training. Well, those are uh, usually extreme Salafi jihadists. And uh, then there's blowback later on. And the thing is, it's not just Afghanistan. Uh, I think we're making a lot of similar mistakes over the past decade in Afghanistan uh, currently uh, and, and over, the, over the past time, uh, Iraq, and of course, and what's, what's been happening in Syria as well. And so um, that's a real problem. You know, why does the United States constantly seem to give radical Muslims weapons and training on how to use them simply to destabilize a region because they view some other kind of threat, but really the long-term consequences aren't seen. And um, it's sad. Um, Christians in the Middle East, a lot of times, unfortunately, Kay, seem to do better under despotic dictator rulership than when the United States gets involved and uh, we leave. And in the aftermath, you have these, these uh, vacuums of power in which the, the first group of people to step into that, of course, are uh, jihadis. And so uh, then Christian towns get wiped out and everything else. So there is a massive problem with that. And I wish the United States would uh, have learned and stopped doing that. But I, I don't know because it doesn't seem like that's the case. Yeah. I'm encouraged, um, actually. Uh, well, I was encouraged by uh, Trump's intervention with the late-term abortion. Uh, stuff in New York and some other states. I think that's a. a I think all abortion is like obviously um, not biblical, but I think that late term, like during birth, after 
I think it's outrageous. Like, I don't know how, I don't know how, I don't know any medical reason. Like there's one medical reason, the mother is about to die. But other than that, to say you'll have a chat with the mother after she's been birthed, if she's changed her mind. I think somehow the drive to normalize transgenderism, to declassify it as a mental illness, somehow like it seems to be connected whether it's all just a like a left of center um kind of agenda but i was speaking the other day with somebody that the the nuclear family for sure christian marriage or state approved christian marriage has been denigrated to the point of uselessness we now have obviously uh, same-sex marriages in churches um i don't know where they need to be there unless they're christian even then like i don't know so we've got a situation with the welfare state, whether it's left wing or right wing, like I don't know, Republican or Democrat for the United States, is irrelevant by the time it's entrenched and single motherhood is a more profitable, like welfare wise uh, option than being married and having a parent where, you know, it doesn't matter who the second parent is physiologically, as long as there are two loving adults bringing up the child. So I think that that ties into America's like stance at home and Britain for sure if we have a strong Christian leader a leader who's willing to stand up for pro-life and who's willing to uh like mention the word prayer or Jesus you know like openly when we're supposed we especially not so much America we're supposed to be a Christian country we have our monarch as the head of the faith as it were I think everything has a, like a knock-on effect and I think then when so if, for example, America is setting a decent morals, like I don't mean in armed sales or any, you know, like that's just uh, something that happens with big countries and like politics, unfortunately. But if, as uh, your president did, you can become like a trendsetter, you can reintroduce prayers, you can speak at pro-life rallies, you can veto late-term abortion stuff, then you have more of a moralistic standpoint to... Um, to protect persecuted Christians, you're not that you're not then protecting them from the from the power vacuum that you helped to create. Like, so I think that it can only be a good thing for larger countries, especially now with petitions and like people power, as it were. Um, there seem to be so many people who have time to go out on rallies lately. Like, they're just there's like a flash mob every five minutes in uh in London. So I think that to get behind you know i mean we've got enough murders at home if you count abortions as well but the situation in nigeria and i'm banging on about it is it's just horrific and it's the stuff of nightmares um just the still images let alone videos it's like babies children girls boys men women pregnant women and uh, it's indiscriminate but the people who are murdering them who happen to be islamic or vouchsafe that they're islamic uh, they also they also kill Muslims, so it's um, it's a pretty confused situation. But um, I'd like to ask anyone watching to pray specifically for Nigeria, for Pakistan, for North Korea, for anyone you find in that top fifty list. Really, any, but specifically, even though God knows your prayers, like He knows He knows what you need and He knows what they need. I think when we focus our attention on a specific topic, God can then reveal more to you and. You know, you, you too can be plagued by Nigerian like horror stories as I am. So with that in mind, um, how did you come into the humorous side of your apologetics? Like, how, did you, are you a naturally funny person? Like, did you just fall into it? Is that always been your style or like, how did that come about? Because I really do enjoy those videos. Well, I guess I have certain uh, character traits and then, you know, if I'm around the right people or wrong people, depending on how you view it, they uh, sort of br uh, draw it or bring it out of me more. And so, you know, I'd known uh, David Wood and some of the fellows for a little bit doing a various Islamic outreach and evangelism debates with Muslims and apologetic ventures and done some interviews and conferences together and things like that. But uh, there wasn't much of a you know, working relationships, say with David or Sam and, and those guys, it was more just, we ran into each other and hung out and, you know, shared similar um, <clears throat> uh, approaches to certain things at certain times, always differences, but you know, but uh, through that, you know, David wanted to not just have a successful YouTube channel on his own. And to those who don't know, I'm speaking of David Wood, Act 17 Apologetics, uh, largest uh, Christian apologetics YouTube channel uh, there 
approaching 500,000 subs uh, probably before the, the year is out. And uh, he wanted, he, he of course had his own successful channel, but he wanted to create and help facilitate a, a number of other social media style apologists. And I was one of the first people, I think he and me, me and a couple other guys approached uh, with sort of uh, this long-term vision. And part of it was, you know, uh, what you might call likability factors and uh, ability to communicate and humor and these kinds of things. And, and so he knew enough about me to know, uh, you know, that might be present and I might be willing to do that, which he was right about. And so, uh, I was open to the idea at that time in my life. He kind of asked me at just the right time where things were open. Uh, if he would ask me a little bit earlier, I probably would have said no. It just it worked out perfect timing. And so we kind of got to work immediately. And one of the first things was, hey, here's some basic ways on how to do videos and whatnot. Because I had mainly focused uh, more on writing via blogs and radio. So not the visual component. And uh, once we started just writing and everything, things up, uh, I think he felt like, oh, you know, I had some improv abilities and different things like that. And so we would script some things out and not script other things. And it uh, just kept on snowballing from there, different little projects that we did. Two of the most well-known, of course, uh, would be Islamicize Me, where atheists go on a journey to become Muslims and they read the sources and do literally what it says, sort of in the most ham-fisted way over a period of 30 days. And then the Boom Boom Room, where Muhammad has an imaginary talk show and he uh, interviews different guests from the uh, current uh, time and uh, as well as the past, some fictional, some non-fictional. And then at the end, you know, uh, usually uh, blows them up. And so, uh, doing those things together and, uh, you know, future ideas as well, uh, just created a lot of synergy. And then other people uh, kind of came around and, you know, for example, Sam Shamu, nobody knew he had acting ability. Then all of a sudden we kind of draw him into the circle and all of a sudden, you know, Sam's the star of the show. So uh, that definitely is part of it. And those are some things that people view as more notable or they remember. But, you know, the daily grind of apologetics is real life conversations with people and talking to people and having conversations public and private and trying to hear people out and then go back and forth with good dialogues and doing live streams because it's sort of a uh, you're interacting with people and stuff like that. And uh, so it's part of the repertoire, you know, humor and comedy. Uh, but of course, it's not the be all end all, at least, at least not for me, but it's definitely uh, in the bag of tricks, as we might say. Yeah. I find myself that, um, like you say, there's a there's a mixture of um, so one-on-one -on -one conversations. Debating is a slightly different style. Um, just the one-on-ones. I think that humor always helps, especially I think with atheists as well, because I don't know. I think the best delivery has to be kindness. Like there has to be um, like genuine concern or care for their salvation. Anyway, like there's no point in just scoring points. It, there's no it's no good to win an argument and lose the soul of the person you're arguing with. Um, but I had a chance today. So God completely changed every plan I had for today. Um, like I have a friend visiting, so I was trying to show them London and then like the bus routes were changed and the things were closed and stuff like that. But I ended up um, ignoring my friend actually for half an hour to speak to a lady in a coffee shop. And once she kind of unraveled her story of what's been going on, like I knew completely that she, like I often pray like can you put them in my way just so I know and it but humor for for sure for me like when I, some of the, to be fair some of the hadiths that I have to discuss like if I didn't have a sense of humor like I couldn't do it with a straight face anyway because some of them are like pretty out there and um yeah I think some of the I think the priests of Baal were mocked at one point so I think there's like scope for humor in the Bible, but I do know of some people who like frown upon it, but they probably frown quite often to be fair. So I just think, yeah, God bless them. Um, it, do you have any projects coming up that you would like to talk about briefly or like, are you, do you still blog? Are you just completely swamped with like making videos and research and stuff like that? Or like yeah, a lot of videos and stuff. Uh, I, um, of course, have a, a book out on the Hebrew Israelites. And um, one thing that I think is a antidote preventative uh, towards them is to recognize, for example, the contributions of black Christians and Christians from Africa throughout church history. And so to that end, I'm actually currently writing an article for a premier Christian magazine, which is London-based, actually. And... Uh, uh, I'm going to highlight a number of uh, lesser known Christian uh, 
uh, figures uh, from really the past, let's say, 500 years or so, primarily, uh, not only from the American context, but globally. So discussing, uh, you know, uh, fan, fantastic people that were, you know, kidnapped at eight years old because of the slave trade and next thing you know, end up earning a PhD, for example, we'll be talking, to, so uh, well, I'm not talking, but the article I'm writing uh, has snapshots of some of these folks. Uh, I don't know what they're going to end up calling. They might call it Tim Black Christians You Should Know or something like that, but it's just uh, really my way to, to help uh, make sure that lesser known but uh, beautiful aspects of church history are known because I think it's helpful for all Christians to know all of our history because it's church history, and then it gives us a better foot and understanding going forward. So, that's something I'm working on that's uh, related to um, your context. Uh, it's a good magazine. It's a print magazine. They got a lot of good stuff they do. And uh, so that's one thing I'm working on currently as far as writing, actually. Yeah. In terms of church history and especially Israelism as well, or Black Hebrew Israelism, um, I think that it's important that, um, like, I, I, I think that so we're all the, obviously the one body of Christ. Um, the verse that I think of, uh, often when I'm talking or thinking about the Christian persecution is um, that if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. It's, if one part of the body of Christ is honoured, then every part rejoices. And I think that too often, or through, it's not even ignorance, through um, listening to even what the, ma the mainstream church puts out, you hear snippets of like, you know, prayers for continents, but then it comes down to, and can we please pray for George in like such and such street? So to acknowledge that the church is persecuted, it's been foretold anyway, it was always going to happen. But to lift those people up and to recognize also that it's not only Islam, that Christianity is not a white religion, as it were, that um, the, the the debate that I often have between like a, a, a patriotic nationalism for your own country where you were born and being a citizen of the kingdom of Christ, they're not contradictory because at least my country has a, a long Christian tradition. Our uh, input into global Christianity has been like momentous. We've helped to stabilize and Christianize parts of the world, which can own like, I don't know of any country that's ever, um, suffered as a result of, of Christianity, of capitalism for sure, of, you know, colonialism, like potentially, but the stabilize, like, because it, it doesn't seek to submit other cultures, it, seem, it seeks to, uh, like, enter the individual heart of each person, and then as a result, the fruits of the Holy Spirit can be seen, and then the country changes in a positive way, like, in Rome, ancient Rome, we stopped infanticide, we glorified marriage, we, you know, of those things i'm just picking up jesus by the way so um yeah i think that the 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 input of all christians needs to be valued recognized and reported honestly and 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 you know in the context of today's political situation honestly as in if something was a thing like back 200 years ago if it was seen as normalized and there were no rallying cries to get rid of this behavior or this cultural you know norm then those people can't now be retrospectively like hated for it because nobody like you know it was a normal thing christianity or britain sought to end slavery we you know we were involved in it for sure but not because we're christian whereas with islam occasionally like those things are in the quran it's not just a cultural uh, amalgamation of stuff so um yeah i look forward to reading your article and if it's in london and if it's print based that will be uh, nostalgic. I don't think I've read it like a printed magazine for quite some time. So that being said, um, yeah, do you see yourself, like with the kind of censorship and the um, inability of certain platforms to have an equal treatment of polemicists of any and all religions, do you, I mean, do you use other social media? Is it mainly YouTube that you're, um, present with like I, I know you have a parlor again I don't know if you're on Twitter because I don't use it like are there any other places where people can find you regularly or your content yeah YouTube is the main place right now but whenever I live stream I also live stream on Facebook and I also live stream actually on a, something called Periscope uh, slash uh, Twitter live and so uh, the live stream is on multiple places 
all at once. Um, uh, you can, you can see it. And, uh, that's, that's one thing, you know, that, that I'll do. And, um, I'm on, you know, Facebook and Instagram and other social media. I don't use them as much as YouTube. Uh, YouTube is sort of the hub, but then, uh, utilize those other things. And so there's different things I might do, like be active on different Facebook groups. That's my, my next, uh, <clears throat> interview coming up today will be, uh, to a particular Facebook group, for example, uh, talking about contextual theology and whatnot. And so, uh, it just depends, um, uh, what's going on, where I need to be, but the, the main focus would be YouTube these days. Yeah. Have you been following the preservation of the Quran, um, fiasco, I think you might call it the, uh, recent developments with Jay Smith and Mohammed Tijab and Yasser Qadi, Shabir Ali. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of that. Um, and Anthony Rogers is, uh, doing some good stuff on, on looking into that more, uh, in regards to, um, just sort of the contradictory statements you're getting from different uh, is Islamic uh, thought leaders uh, on these issues. But, um, you know, Yasser Qadi, despite whatever his uh, faults may be, seems to um, have trouble being um, <laughs> as dishonest as some of the other guys. And so when he's pressed to, to be somewhat forthright about uh, challenges in the text of the Quran, which if Muslims uh, by and large, just sort of recognize that that's a reality with ancient documents. It wouldn't actually be such a, a bombshell, but because of the really denial of the reality of the way these things work, including the Bible, uh, a, re a, real a sort of a denial of that basic reality as if every manuscript ever penned of the Quran literally reads the same thing, which is really the picture you get a lot of times from basic polemicists, uh, for Islam and whatnot. Um, if, if that hadn't been done, it wouldn't be such a big deal in my view about what's going on now. But so Yasser Qadi is being pressed, of course, in this interview by Muhammad Hijab, who apparently has since taken down that section uh, of, of the interview because of the, the backlash that it caused. And he basically says, Hey, we should talk about this some other time, you know, let's not talk about it now. And, and, but, uh, he's not able to do that because hijab keep on, keeps on asking him. And so it's basically like, well, uh, yeah, there, there's some holes in the preservation of the Quran basically. And just meaning the textual history is not perfect or pure. And really the study of this issue is very embryonic and has been done primarily more so by uh, non-Islamic scholars. Whereas when it comes to Christian, uh, Christian text, specifically the Bible, it's uh, the opposite. Certainly lots of people are involved in studying the, the text and its history and its transmission and any elements of corruption and redaction, all those kinds of things. Um, uh, but it's, it's something Christians have embraced since the beginning. You know, you go all the way back to origin and he was messing around with textual criticism, so to speak, in regards to the scripture. Well, now uh, you have this very embryonic textual criticism in relationship to the Quran because of all the hiding and shuffling and, and all that kind of stuff going on. You have um, uh, some non-Muslim scholars who are sort of on the periphery, you know, hiding pictures of documents and this kind of kind of James Bond esque kind of thing they've got to be involved with almost sometimes because of uh, a lot of Islamic authorities reticence to recognize the black and white nature uh, of the of the fact of what's in front of them and uh and Muslim scholars, it's a sort of a different thing. And you can see just by Yasser Qadi making a very small admission, really, of this massive blowback. And it just doesn't really speak well, to be frank, to the uh, genuine uh, sort of like, it makes it seem like there's a lot of disingenuine, disingenuine antics going on when it comes to the power structure of Islam, which is a real shame because it's, it's a disservice to people that want to be uh, knowing the truth and that claim that one of the 99 names of, of God is truth and, and people who want to really know what's going on. And uh, they're just kind of being lied to and, and it's an unfortunate thing. And so it'll be interesting to see what the future is uh, from this for now. But I'm actually glad for uh, Yasser Qadi's sake, to be frank with you, that he lives in the West and not, say, in uh, Egypt or something like that. Because I don't know. Uh, it's one thing to have a job, but I don't know if he would still have his head just based upon the minimal statements he made, which that's not really what we want. We don't want 
uh, somewhat honest Islamic scholars to, to you know, get murked by, by the power structures that be the second they say something controversial, because there can be really no back and forth dialogue, even amongst internal I'm just speaking internally here, one Muslim to, to each other, and that really needs to change. But the question is, will it change? Will there be a level of maturity that's needed to look at these things? And um, I sort of, you know, cross my fingers, hope against hope. Uh, but we shall see. I think the massive, like the thing that had been highlighted for me, just, just from that interview alone, um, he spoke about a red line. Um, and that is an explanation as to why for at least 30 to 40 years, even when Jay has been debating people like Shabir Ali, there's been no give at all with the statement that there is one Quran is perfectly preserved. There are no changes there, are, I guess, apart from the, the Kirat being added like at a later date, it's all exactly as it was, no book burning, like, well, not after uh, Uthman, you know, all of the different versions that came up and then kind of went away again, the fact that they were in the wrong places. Stuff like that hasn't been attested to at all. Also, Yasser Qadi mentioned, uh, I think it, the phrase he used was normal Muslims. He said, I'm quite happy to speak to you, Mohammed, after we've gone off air. I'm more than happy to speak to advanced students, etc." cetera, um, which like Mohammed Tijab just basically ignored that and carried on president. But he said, all the normal or average Muslim needs to know is this. And that for me was a massive red flag if I'd have been a Muslim, especially because it didn't like it, it, it's basically saying that there's one truth for one group of people and then everybody else can have this like lesser truth. And the Christians, I, I think the drive to textually criticize ourselves comes from the fact that we know we have the truth personified, literally Jesus Christ says he's the truth and he's not a liar. So the truth can't be damaged by examination. It cannot become more true or less true. It is still the apps, like it's the truth. It's an absolute standard. Whereas when you have um, contradictory statements in a book that claims itself to be a miracle without error, without contradiction, and even goes as far as to say, if you find a contradiction, all of it is in error. That's like a very dangerous game to play, especially when um, even just modern science, which I don't hold to all of it, but um, some of the things about reproduction, like, you know, um, like they're just uh, physiologically wrong. Like it's it, that's literally provable just by even an autopsy. You can see where babies come from, as it were. So um, I would be I'm also glad I was praying pretty hard for Yasser Qadi when he made those statements, because I, you know, like. Um, a religion whose um, adherents have to use violence or um, like, you know, suppress the truth or suppress even Mohammed Hijab made a video, I think it was last year at Speaker's Corner about the, like, uh, I don't the cascade or the, the tumultuous number of apost apostates from Islam, like, and they keep it quiet. Um, it's like understandable. <laughs> the individuals keep it very quiet. But as a, as a community, it's not something that's spoken about. And he was trying to raise awareness of all of these people leaving Islam. And now he's done us a very big favor. Um, between him and a couple, couple of other Muslim apologists, I know they're taking down Islam quicker than the Christian polemicists of Islam could hope to do. But that being said, we're still uh, looking into all those differences. And if they're theological, if they're just linguistic, if they change the nature of the verse, like, there's, there's far more than one Quran. Um, and on that happy note, um, yeah, I think I don't have any more real, like, big questions for you. What I would like to say is I'd hope to speak to you again on our main channel um, because there are many more uh, viewers there. I'm going to link, I'm going to go back through and watch this and link the book that you mentioned, the article, if you have the potential name of it, or at least the magazine, if you can give me that afterwards, I'll link that. Your, obviously, your channel like i know you're very busy and i'd like to thank you very much for speaking to me and i hope i'll be able to speak to you again soon also we seem to have lost our resident hebrew israelites at speaker's corner i don't know what happened to them hopefully they're healthy um well uh, according to the news i've seen um uh, it looks like uh they sort of been uh chased out 
of Speaker's Corner due to uh, what perceives to be honestly a fear of Muslims. And instead of taking to doing things like harassing, harassing Jews at the supermarket and uh, their daily delis in, in the Jewish neighborhoods there. That's what appears to me because usually Hebrewsites intimidate everyone by their uh, puffed up machismo. But, uh, you know, all it takes is uh, the reality of living in London, I think, for them to see that's not going to work when you have large groups of Muslims because you're going to be outnumbered. And Muslims are uh, not as nice as Christians on a, on a regular basis, to be frank with you. And so the Hebrews lights, um, I think you won't see them back at Speaker's Corner on a regular basis until they think they've got their numbers up because of the way that they need to operate. Will that day ever happen? Don't know. But in the meantime, look for them uh, harassing uh, old men with side curls at the deli market. I don't think I'd look good as a footstool, just on a side note. Like I'd, you know, just prefer to like be a regular resident of heaven rather than like furniture. Um, I think, yeah, in terms of aggression, I've seen uh, some of them like physically assault people um, at the park, always outnumbered by Muslims, as mostly everybody is at the park because of the, like it's in an area that's got a big Arab presence anyway. Um, and people would like to come and listen to that. Thank God, I never thought I'd say it, that the Muslim apologists, the Dawa team are back as of last week. Um, Hashim and Adnan Rashid showed up. And Ali Dawa as well. I wasn't expecting him because I didn't think Mohammed Hijab would ever show up again. But he's like a sidekick. So hopefully where one goes, the other will follow. Mohammed Hijab owes me a debate anyway. I may change the topic now. Um, but yeah, he's done us a favour. Romans 8.28, I'm often reminded um, that all things work to the good of those who are called according to his purpose. So even if you think you've got a catastrophe on your hands, um, quite often God will let you know that you're not all knowing and he is. So yeah, thank you ever so much. Um, I'm going to put the links in. I'm going to ask everybody to go to your channel, which is just Vocab Malone, B-O-C-A-B-M-A-L-O-N-E. And mm -hmm. if they... Um, there will be a link in the channel anyway, but please look at the Boom Boom Room. Like, just please, because you won't regret it. It's just funny. Um, yeah, so I'm going to say God bless you. I'm going to stop recording and then chat to you for a minute. And thank you again. Have you got anything you just want to say as a parting shot, as it were? Well, definitely people should go youtube.com slash vocab and subscribe because right now we're finishing up doing the two-year anniversary special edition run of Islamicize Me on the channel. And so you're able to watch it with other viewers live because I premiere it. And so uh, I think we're on day 26 or something like that. And uh, it's been a fascinating journey so far. So if people didn't catch it or if they did and want to experience it a different way, you should definitely check that out because Islamicize Me special edition is happening as we speak. Brilliant. And I, I, as far as I remember from the old ones, there's an episode with the Hebrew Israelites. So <laughs> have a look mm -hmm. at that. So. Yeah, that All one right. actually got banned by YouTube. And so we had to re-edit it and make the Snowflake edition. My gosh. It's just, don't get me started. I'll start running. It's ridiculous. The stuff that gets banned when there's literally, like on Twitter, for example, there's um, Hezbollah, <laughs> like in their statement, talking about wiping out the Jews. That's fine. But I'm like, let's not mock a really, I don't know. I don't. I think that. YouTube's uh, trust and safety team may have mistaken, even though we think it's rather obvious, uh, are critiquing the anti-Semitism shared by the Islamic sources and Hebrew Israelites. They may have mistaken our satirical presentation of that anti-Semitism as legitimate anti-Semitism. I think that's actually what happened. And so that's why I made the snowflake edition to make it obvious and uh, sort of in a passive aggressive way, uh, strike back. So we censor out everything, but the result is kind of funny because then it sounds like we're cursing the whole time, which we're not. So just go on the channel, watch Islamicize me snowflake edition. You can see the edited version since they banned the other one and I got a strike for it and everything. You can actually see the edited version there and enjoy it. Can I just lastly, can I just ask, did you appeal the decision? Because Mm -hmm, They're yeah. so obviously tongue in cheek that it'd have to be an answer machine message reviewing the videos. To like, yeah, I, expl I explained all that. I even used uh, what I perceived to be language that they would understand. Uh, you used you know, love trigger language. words. Yeah, the language of the day, for example, is anti-racism. Micro a number of other words, yeah. and I used, but um, uh, it didn't work. 
So yeah, I mean, that's that's a real shame. But always have a backup of them, obviously, and stick them in other places, and we'll find them, and they'll be uploaded again, I'm sure. All right, God bless you, very cap, and uh, I'm going to stop this recording. And thank you, everybody, for watching and subscribe, share, like, comment, um, like all the good stuff. Pray, repent, obviously, um, turn to Christ because um, hashtag He's God. And uh, yeah, just get on with it. And if you don't believe, just pray about it anyway. What have you got to lose? All right. God bless everybody. Bye.